Let's start the recording. Okay, so this week uh, at the data school, they've been creating content for preparation for the Tableau QA exam. So the idea is for this content to then be used for our center of excellence to help run classes for them for uh, exam preparation. So we thought uh, what they're gonna do today is kind of give a real high level overview of the stuff that they went through. Um, not, uh, not a ton of detail, but just enough so you guys can get a feel for the sort of content that's covered in the exam and the things you need to know in order to pass it. So we're gonna start with Marcus. Marcus? Yeah. Okay, so let me give you control. Thank you. Control. And if you have any questions along the way, just type them in yeah. and we can respond to those as well. Awesome. Yeah, so for this week, uh, my challenge or my task was to sort of teach an introduction lesson into analytics within Tableau. Um, when speaking about analytics, I'm actually talking about this pane here, which has all the different forms of analytics that you can do in Tableau. Built-in analytics. Yeah, built-in analytics, yeah. Um, I basically told this in the format of a, a story. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk you through my slides uh, quite quickly. And so, yeah, we started off with an intro. These are the sort of the topics that I hope to uh, plan to cover, cover during the lesson. Um, but yeah, as time got cut down a tiny bit, we sort of had to take a few bits out. But I've still kept all my slides uh, for everyone to see. Um, I've done it sort of in the format of like a proper lesson. So we had like a, a little intro to me. And then asked everyone else to introduce themselves before going into sort of understanding what data analytics is. And the different types of analytics. Yeah, the different types of analytics out there. So um, my whole plan was to sort of tell this whole this class as sort of a story. So as we can see here, we have four types of data analytics. Uh, descriptive, which is the what's happening in your business. The diagnostic, the why, the predictive, uh, like what's likely to happen if we don't make changes. And the prescriptive of what do you need to do uh, in order to, to like remedy this issue. And so I took everyone through my slides in a way of answering the the what, the why, the what's going to happen, and what could happen okay. if we don't make changes. Yep. And so, yeah, sort of, as it's just an introduction, I sort of took everyone through different types of analytics that you can do. So that started off nice and easy with reference lines and reference bands. And I just gave everyone a nice intro into what they are and what they do. So you can see here a nice little intro into what the reference lines and bands are and what like the the main components of them are and sort of also going into reliability and talking about the r square value um for anyone online who doesn't understand what the r square value is it is a statistical measure <laughs> of closeness uh closeness of data to the regression line so the closer that number the r value the r squared value is to one is the high accuracy of the uh, so one would be perfectly reliable. Yeah, yeah. so one would be perfectly reliable. Anything like far below that will be pretty unreliable. So yeah, so okay. you also walked through examples of each of these as well, right? Yeah, so exercises, right? yeah, um, as I was teaching, we sort of built up a few bits and bobs, but uh, I sort of just gave the class a scenario and starting off nice and easily, I just re renamed some data. So I used the superstore data. Mm -hmm. And we named it to Dom Lewis. Okay. Um, <laughs> he sold furniture, electronics, and all of that sort of thing. And sort of just gave the class a little test just to build basic reference lines starting off with. Okay. So, for example, Dom Lewis wants to see uh, how each region compares to their 90,000 project target. And instantly we could see that only one region didn't hit that target. So that sort of answers the what's going on. So South, for example, mm -hmm. hasn't reached that target. And, and this is a type of view you might need to actually build in, uh, could be a, a question on the exam. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so in the exam they could say to you... Um, how many regions? Yeah, how many regions fall below the the uh, limit of 90K or... Right. And then sort of, I'll take the class through different views. So they could also ask these consumers. Okay. 
uh, which regions per consumer sort of don't reach the target, which ones have gone over target. And usually because it's multiple choice question, multiple choice answers, you just, uh, you can take multiple ones. So this sort of covered that, okay. that area. And yeah, so I sort of got the class to build it along with me mm -hmm. and like built one with them and then got everyone else to go off and try and do some, some challenges. And as you can see here, sort of, I just took everyone through how I built it okay. and where, where I put which each part. Uh, I did get my order a bit mixed up. So we went from reference lines to reference bands. And again, uh, answering the what's going on. So Don Lewis wants to see if sales for year are within their target band of 40 to 150K. And as you can see pretty much immediately, the good thing with reference bands is the fact that it's sort of like an immediate effect on the person looking at it. You can instantly see where the band is and you can instantly see what's above and what's below it. And yeah, so consumers like doing really good. Corporate is bang in the middle, but however, home office it's slacking a tiny bit. Even though it's on the rise again, it's still slacking a tiny bit, but you can see the home office is the only one that's really gone out the bottom end where it hasn't reached that lower target. And again, we just got everyone to build it along with me. And yeah, I just talked to everyone through how we done that. Uh, we then moved on to box plots. So this is another one that came up in the exam where it asked about distribution, uh, which I cannot remember the exact question, but it's something like which subcategory had the biggest distribution in a certain product or product name. And at the time, it's just the way they worded it, it was a bit awkward, but sort of, uh, I did and didn't word it equally as good myself, so um, yeah. But I mean, I talked to everyone through box plots, what each part of a box plot means. And That's very good. Yeah, it's just like a nice introduction. I didn't try to use any big words in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would have probably confused myself, to be honest. Yep. But it <laughs> kept it nice and simple for everyone. And yeah, we went on to sort of, again, using the mm -hmm. Dom Lewis, we went to see distribution and outliers. So again, box plots are a good way of seeing your distribution and also spotting outliers in your data. So what doesn't fall within the box and whiskers? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just gave everyone a challenge to sort of build this this view. And I left the, uh, what's that called again? That little box. Uh, I, I forgot what that's called. This here box. Oh, the, oh, the, uh, that's the one, the annotation. Yeah, I left the annotation, which was the only key, uh, clue to everyone in the class. The scale, as to right? what was in, yeah, yeah, as to what they'll need to look for. So I, I sort of used a title and this little um, annotation, just to give everyone an idea of what they need to build, but without giving them the exact answer of what right. goes where. Right. So yeah, everyone just build that up. And we also got to like discuss a bit about box and Mr. Plots, which was really useful, which I thought was quite useful for everyone. So in this one, which one has the highest distribution? Yeah, so we can see all mapy tables all the way at the bottom. So you can see the actual box part of the box plot has a so massive distribution. So for those people on the, on the phone, how do you know which one's the distribution? Is it by the size of the whiskers, the size of the box, the size of the, where the median is? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Uh, it's mainly the size of the box. So the box covers the median, I think it is, the median and the 50% quartiles. So, yeah, so the, the, the box being kind of this part here, right? Yeah, so. So that's from the 75th to the 25th percentile. That's right? correct, yeah. And then whatever's outside of the box is what's not within the right. uh, 50%. That makes up the so box. you're looking for the widest box, basically. That's yeah. correct, yeah. So you're always looking for the widest box when it comes to the exam, um, if it asks you about distribution. So this is sort of a nice view that's quite easy to build. And again, it gives you an instant feedback on what you visually see, which one has the biggest box in there. And Excellent. also, again, if they ask about outliers, it's another way of spotting outliers too, mm -hmm. which is really handy. I thought it was really handy. Um, in the time we had, we then moved on to forecasting. So um, I use this picture, which gave a good example of bad forecasting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because why is it bad? Because as we can see, the forecast line is way bigger than the actual the date period that we're using. And uh, bad practice, why? Because when you are forecasting too far into the future, your, the accuracy of your forecast tends to fall off completely and reduce um, significantly. So. A good rule of thumb is to never have it longer than the actual uh, date date range you're using. 
Um, for the example I use with the class, we've done a six month look forward into the future with our uh, forecast. And there you can see sort of the accuracy will, I mean, you can see it here too. So around here, you can see where the line is still very squiggly. So you can see the, the accuracy in the data is still there. However, once it goes past a certain period, it just evens out completely. So you can't really see any minor detail in there. And yeah, just gave everyone an intro into what forecasting is and sort of like a use case. Again, if a company wants to see or predict what might be going on with their products in the future, forecasting is a good way of seeing that. And also checking if like their, summers, their sales are going to go up or down or profits up and down. And yeah, so we just done a little, this was a very straightforward, easy one. And yeah, um, again, Dom Lewis wants to see a sales forecast so they can get a look into how their sales will do over the coming months. And I just got the class just to build a nice little simple six month estimate going forward. So if I could be going to the forecast, forecast options, you can see exactly six months ahead of time with a 90% prediction interval. I mean, it's at standard, it stays at 95%. But just to give everyone something to think about, I changed it just to make it not so easy. Yeah. And yeah, everyone done pretty well on getting that sorted. And then, yeah, to finish up, because of the time I had, uh, we moved on to trend lines and trend models. So there are a whole bunch of different ways you can use trend lines. And on here, it says that trend lines are good at spotting patterns in your data. And I've just given a few examples on the right hand side. Um, but we sort of went in and built some ourselves. So what we have here is the linear, which shows sort of a steady increase and decrease, which is good for seeing a steady increase and decrease. The line tends to be straight, but can be curves. Um, and yeah, it's good for seeing a steady pattern, like a decrease or increase over time. Uh, we've done also logarithmic, which is mainly shows a rapid increase and decrease and then levels out towards the ends. And one of the key features with uh, logarithmic is that you can use negative and positive values in, in this. So for example, if you're tracking profit over time, there's always gonna be some parts where profit goes down and it might go below zero. So yeah, logarithmic could be the best use for that one. Uh, we also have exponential that indicates data is rising at an increasing rate over time. So think of an example would be a pre-release of a new games console, for example. Pre-orders on the build-up to, to the game being released, pre-orders always start to climb really high the closer the date gets. But then as soon as the, the game's uh, released, it will start to drop off and orders will start to go down. And yeah, and then, uh, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, so that was that's a pretty example that I drove there. We also have polynomial at the bottom. Uh, polynomial is good for seeing like sort of fluctuation. There's fluctuation in your data. So an example here for gains and losses over time. So polynomial sometimes tends to take on like a sort of N shape. So over time, again, another example, the games console being released, everyone will buy it over a certain period, but after that period has gone by, the sales will start to drop and it will sort of form like an N shape where sales will shut up and then drop down at the end. And yeah, I don't think we've done too much of an example of it. No, that was just something I built uh, throughout the day as we were just discussing different topics. Yeah. And yeah, uh, this is sort of... Explanations for, the, for when you would use each of the different types of trends. Yeah, stuff. I thought that'd be useful to have in there, sort of, yeah. sort of a use case. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can still add in a bit more into use yeah. cases. Yeah, and sort of that's what I came up with for awesome. my part of the lesson. So yeah, right. analytics, well interest, done. analytics in Tableau. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yes, you next. Okay, well. And again, if anybody has any questions online, just feel free to type them in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll answer those. All right. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Will. Uh, so the the topic I was asked to uh, look at this week was dimensions and measures. Um, and so since it's quite a, a dry topic, I'm going to do a, a small sort of uh, introduction to, to really understanding dimensions and measures. Uh, even though I, I assume if you're taking the, the exam, you should be able to distinguish the two and understand how they work. 
And then I'm just going to give you some sort of general tips that I think would be really useful for the exam, things that I kind of stressed out on while I was doing it or, so yeah, so let's start with this and, and I'll jump into this. So, so I just gave this lecture to, to the rest of the, the DSers today, so thankfully it's quite fresh. So understanding dimension measures, so we're just going to start with dimensions. So when you load your data into Tableau, the software will try and sort of categorize them in two different categories to make your the process of analyzing it as simple as possible. So one of those categories is called dimensions. So any data that is discrete categorical information will be tossed in that category. So if we just look here, so this is just data from the sample superstore set. Uh, you can see what discrete category information means. So we've got our, our things like strings, so just text, so for example, people's names. Uh, we have dates, uh, so just time-related information, geography, so where things happened, and things that are numerics, but that give sort of categorical information. So here we have row ID, but that could also be, for example, an order ID, or just something that just gives a categorical piece of information. So moving on to that, uh, so the, the reason that uh, Tableau will put these different fields in, in the dimension pane is to sort of try and help you and answer the, the following questions, which are who, when, where, and generally why. So these are sort of the, the fields that will break up your measures, and they'll try and help you understand who is my customer, where does my, what category does my customer fall into, what product is it, where would this all happen? Which are what you'll need to sort of break up things like your sales for the year, your profits for the year, and understand why did my sales in this particular region do poorly? Was it because of my customer? Was it because of something else? That's kind of what those what dimensions try to help the question they try to help you understand. So an easy way to sort of tell that you have a dimension. Uh, so first of all, when when you bring it in, Tableau thing is discrete, so it'll make the pill for it blue. Uh, so blue pills are discrete, green pills are continuous. And what that means, effective discrete, is that when you drag it into so either your column or row shelf, Tableau will display a row header or column header if it's discrete. Um, so that's just I've added a little screenshot. So that's just what row headers mean. So it just splits your, it's just put all the, the different categories there. And that will do now is that if you bring in so a measure, so I'm sorry, it's quite small. So here this this green pill is sum of sales. If you bring in a measure now in, in your column shelf your dimension will split that data into the category that it falls into. So here, our dimension is splitting our sales measure into the different sales, into the different categories that we have. So that's really the basics of dimension. They're just there to categorize your data and help you understand it better, and they help split, or they split your, your different measures. Um, so before I go, I'll just jump to the basics first. I'll skip these little things. It. Where is it? Now? You've got a uh, total of contents on the left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow, thank you. Tired. No, you still used. So now we looked at dimensions. So, it's gonna, so now we're going to look at so measures, so which is the other category. So anything that is quantitative numerical information, uh, Tableau will, will drop it into the, the measures um, part of your, your data pane. And so if you look at just at the screen, you can see quite clearly what those are. So it's going to be sales figures, quantity, discount. And so these answer the question of what and how much. So that's pretty much it. Um, and so whenever Tableau sees this kind of information, it'll believe, it'll, it'll so display it as green. So that means it's continuous. And I mean that Tableau will represent it by building an axis. And so the reason it does this is because you, it, it makes more sense to display these numbers on a continuous axis than just to build row or column headers with it. But more importantly, what it will do is, so you can see here, once again, it's quite small, is that Tableau will aggregate this information. So you can see here with this little sum in front of the sales, so that must be quite small. But so whenever D Tableau sees data which it thinks makes sense to aggregate, so aggregate means taking many rows and converting them into one figure, it'll think that that is a measure, and so it'll drop it into the measures part of your, your pane, and it will, uh, by default, make it a continuous value. And so that's really the key difference. Your, your measures will be values that will be aggregated, and that by default will be represented by Tableau on a continuous axis, whereas your dimensions will be you know, qualitative, discrete information that will split these measures up um, and, 
and, and yet and show you that view. Uh, so I'm not going to get before the exam. I'm not going to get too far into the the really complexities of it. Um, but what's important to, to sort of understand is that these, these ideas of measurements and dimensions are just suggestions by Tableau. So this is just designed to make your, your experience of using Tableau more you know, intuitive, simpler. But these aren't you know, things that are written in stone. They're quite subjective, I guess, uh, definitions. So you can very easily convert uh, so some of your dimensions into continuous fields. So if it was a date or if it was numerics, you could make those continuous. Um, you can make any dimension into a measure except time. Uh, so you can just see here, you can just convert those to measures. And what Tableau will do is it'll find a way to transform it into an aggregate. So if you're, for example, our customer ID, it'll, um, it will pretty much count. So for most of these strings, it'll either be a, a count or a, or a max and min, the different options that it has. And it will pretty much count every instance of customer ID and return that. So you, you are, Tableau does allow you to do these things, but of course it doesn't really make sense or Tableau knows that you're probably not bringing your customer IDs to do counts. And that's why by default, it'll put in your dimensions. But once again, you can turn these things back into measures if you'd like. And the same thing goes for our measures, which we can manipulate. So by default, your measure will be, as I said, a continuous and aggregate field. So continuous because it will be represented on axes when you bring it to Tableau, and aggregated because Tableau will either make it a sum or an average. But you can go and make these yeah, discrete. You can basically, have any combination, right? Exactly. Um, so yeah. So that's quite the. So I think for for the sake of the exam, just being able to know the basics, what I said about dimensions and, and measures, is really simple. Going deeper would be just more of a waste of your time. And so I'll show, just show you the second uh, portion of what I, I prepared for my lesson this week, which is. Oh, oh did I? Sure, you're screwing it. Yeah, I think I think I left it back. Too eager. I think I left it. Did you close your? Yeah, I think okay. I. We can come back. Yeah, it's fine. Oh. Oh, did the whole thing? No. Oh yeah, you just dropped off. Okay, so you need to rejoin it. No, I am on it. It's the Wi-Fi. No, I am on it. And so yeah, so there's a second aspect. Um, so the different chart types. So in the exam, I don't. Do you guys remember there was questions about different chart types? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Page nine. Yeah. Yeah. So so th this collection you can actually find it on on Tableau's website uh, very very easily. So this is the one I made just to show everybody here. But these are just the sort of let's say most more advanced, common. yeah, yeah. Mo most common, but more advanced sort of charts that, that you'll have to come across and sort of understand. Okay. Uh, so the one that I had to go through, so was for example, a histogram. So I've actually built quite a complicated histogram here. Um, but a histogram pretty much will, will bin, so we'll, we'll build bins uh, out of, so here, for example, it's my, my discount. So it'll take all my different discount uh, so from, from my measure and build bins so that it'll go from with a different step size. So for example, if my if my discounts are like 10%, 20%, 30%, and in increments of 10, uh, I could make a bin that would be 10 to 40, and then a bin that would be 40 to 60, and then a bin that would be 60 to 80. And then I can check, I can put these bins, so as you can see up here, and I can then look at the number of my products that fall into each of these bins. So typically when you do a histogram, you would then be in your the, the the bar would typically then be some type of dimension that you're counting, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So um, if you wanted to know, for example, so you, your discount bin, so you would you would do like a count distinct on yeah, product name, right? Exactly. Yeah. Instead of a measure. Yeah, you were just playing around it. And so here, how many products? Yeah, you need to format your discount. <laughs> Because yeah. since you're in a lot, so I'm guessing it's every twenty percent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I can yeah. just or every just, 16 percent. Uh, So yeah, there you go. so here are the different bins. So you can see how many of my products fall into each of these right. different bins. Right. And histograms are just really useful for seeing the distribution of your data. And I think about how to question the exam about that. But they're quite straightforward. So I'd say just build one out for yourself. Of each of these types, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or yeah, some of these. So towards the end over here, Pareto control chart are a bit more advanced. I don't think you'll have those. 
uh, but things like, for example, the Gantt chart. So this is actually, I know this looks quite ugly, but this is the one from the from the Tableau website. Um, so this one is just showing you the, the sort of time it takes for um, an order to be shipped based on the ship mode that the people selected. And so you can see, yeah, so your first class and same day are, are very quick, whereas your standard class are much slower. And so building this chart is actually quite simple, but I, I would definitely go through building a Gantt chart. They're quite, I think, on high chance you might fall on that one in the exam. Uh, highlighter, chart, highlighter chart as well. Uh, so I had a question about this, and I ended up, I've never really used highlighter charts much, uh, but they're actually quite useful, and, and all they involve pretty much is, is uh, selecting a, so one of your dimensions that's in view, and then just hitting this little show highlighter option, which will just show this highlighter filter to the right. And from here, you can either just scroll over, and, and it will highlight a product for you, or you can just select one, and then you can find it in the in your entire products. So I know I, I think I had I don't think I had a question about those, but definitely could come on. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, so a few other ones. Cross tab that's just your general table, your heat map. So that's the one where it's sort of yeah, just color coding according to um, sort of the yeah magnitude of some measure. So here it's our profits. So I think it's um, percent total. Uh, of, of yeah, the contribution of each subcategory in its region. Uh, so definitely just build one of those out. Uh, and once again, there's really, really good examples on the Tableau website of all of these things. So we have tree map as well. Quite simple, straightforward. I've actually kind of combined the idea of a bar chart and a, and a tree map into this one. So you sort of get it, it, it more useful because you can see the sort of order of magnitude, so you can compare which ones of your regions are bigger relative to the other ones, while also identifying, you know, problematic categories within it. Um, but so yeah, so I, I would um, I would say definitely these um, scatter plot, all, all the really center ones, like scatter plots, line charts, bar charts, I don't think they're necessarily gonna be a question because they're quite straightforward, but things like box, so box plots, Gantt charts, um, yeah, highlighters and histograms. I, I'd say those, yeah, the high chance. They do ask the scatters with the trends often. They yeah. set the profit against sales. Yeah, that's true. So actually, that's how I built it here as well. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, so they do. Yeah, so they do. How many products are above the mm. trend line or something like that? Or, yeah. or what trend line yeah. um, gives the highest R or something like okay. that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so for example, here's a good example because I have, I have multiple ones. So, you do have a. So, as you can see, if, if you go on each trend line, it'll actually tell you the R square. Uh, and I would just maybe read up on understanding what that first formula means. Means So profit equals so 0 0.22 times sales plus so the intercept. I would maybe just read up really quickly what this means uh, because I, I think I had a question about that formula. It wasn't very complicated, but if you just have read up on it, it will make, you know, answer that question very easy. Um, and also good to know if you just go here and um, edit trend line. So here you've got all the different options uh, that you can choose from. And I believe actually in my polynomial, they specified that it was a degree three one, for example. So that's where you would go. Two, right? yeah. so, and they probably had this, the answer in there if you forget to change it to three. Exactly, right? exactly, yeah. yeah. So I think mine was comparing the R squares between all four, and then it was a third degree oh, polynomial. Yeah, so that means just go here, change it. And if you didn't change it, the polynomial was smaller than the exponential, something like that. And okay. once you did, it did. So that's good to know. So that's where the, the option for that is. Um, and you've also got these options down here. So you can force it in case they add some specific little condition or they f phrase it very strangely, anything linked to, to that trend line will be located down here. So that's kind of Excellent. chart types pretty much it. Yeah. Good job. Well done. Um, yeah. Who's, who wants to go next? Me? Hello everyone, uh, I had the topic of organizing data, which I also presented today with Will, and the focus of this is primarily filters, sets, groups, hierarchies, uh, and then I kind of threw in a few extra topics that I thought were relevant, like bins and clustering. For the exam, the most relevant ones will be groups and filters, but I'll just quickly go through um, what I kind of taught uh, at data school today. 
So I kind of just wanted to say, um, what's the purpose of organizing data? Why do we, you know, do it? What kind of benefit do you get as an analyst to have more categories? I know in the exam, though, they often give you a map and they ask you to manually group things to, to calculate. Um, you don't get that kind of context, but um, at least when you're you're teaching, you kind of you do want to get these uh, bits out. Uh, so the most common use, as I said in the exam, is that you use filters to extract only what you need um, and also use filters to limit um, what you're calculating so that the calculations are simpler. So often if you lose marks in your calculations section, it's because you haven't done your filtering correct, actually. So it might come under calculations, but actually it's really organizing your data too when you're doing them. Um, but yeah, why do we also organize data in a more general sense? Um, just to identify, you know, exactly what the problem areas are if you can you can organize things it's much clearer to see okay this is the top of the products this is the top of the region i can compare my region to another region um, so you can benchmark you can add additional analysis so on and so forth and you can also help improve the usability of your dashboards um, but as i said if you organize your data it makes you understanding your data um, you know a lot simpler of a process and it makes it a lot easier whilst you're going through your exam so So filters. Filters essentially are just, you know, extracting a subset of your data. And there's five main types of filtering in Tableau. So there's context filters, extract filters, data source filters, dimension filters, and measure filters. And all of those occur at different points. And if you do one um, when you don't mean to, if you, let's say, put something in context when you don't mean to, or if you don't put something in data source, it means that the value you will return by putting a measure into your view will be completely different. Uh, so it's very important to understand that when you're filtering, you're returning a subset, and certain calculations like LOD occur before it, um, or table calculations occur right after it. So that's, that's a very important part. And I had um, the class go through a little exercise where they had to use almost every type of um, filter just so that they would go through the steps and, and arrive at the same results. Otherwise, if they you know, didn't do it correctly, any tiny little mistake, you get heavily penalized because the filtering system has to be correctly configured. If you don't put into context, your top 10 won't work. Um, if you don't do one filter here in a certain way, then the other filters won't work. So it's very important to understand the order of operation with filters. So then one turn to a quite a simple topic is just sorting. You can do this in a lot of software. Just how do you arrange your data? So you can arrange it by the particular values. If it's numeric, you can order it numerically. Or if it's a string, you can order it in terms of the alphanumeric. Um, and even with fields, you can order them based off of another field. So on the end, I was kind of just showing the example. So these countries might actually be ordered instead of alphabetically by a value, let's say GDP. So in Tableau, this is often what we do. So in this case, I had a bunch of countries and I had them sort just by national income. Straightforward, but we'll get on to nesting sorting later, which is um, a question they often ask in the exam as well. So they won't usually ask you something this simple, but this might be a way for you to get an answer. So sometimes they'll ask you to find the most, the top four most profitable, group that, and then reuse that somewhere else. So that's also part of the exercises I built today is I had them build groups and sets that they would later reuse. And I think that's good practice for you to do. Build sets and groups from one field, let's say profit, and then reuse them to find your sales later on. Because that's often you know, a very common question they ask. Uh, very simple exercise to build a hierarchy. Uh, don't need much more explanation than that and how dates are hierarchies. Uh, so nested sorting. This is another case where they do ask you, and it's one of those ones that can trip you up really quickly. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find blogs on different methods. There's, like, I'd like to call them four main methods. So you can do combined fields, um, use an index with a custom sort, or like anything with a custom sort, a table calculation of rank on your field, and then you can take the measure, make it uh, a negative or a positive, depending on what kind of sort you want it on, make it discrete and put it between. So those are just the four methods to keep in mind if you get asked this in your exam. And you have to make sure that whatever it is that's sorting is between your um, highest level, so in this case, income group and country. So then groups and sets, this is another thing. Um, I think in our data school, this was identified as the area that most people were kind of unsure about the difference. 
because often in the exam or in your day-to-day -day use, you pretty much only use groups, whether rightly or wrongly. Um, the exam never really asked you about sets or I never came across it. It was probably possible to calculate some of the questions using sets, but it, it, people didn't tend to do it, or at least I didn't find that people suggested it that way. So group is kind of just like a dimension that you create in Tableau, whereas set is very much the same function as a filter. It, it gets a subset of your data, and it then classifies it as in or out, and, and that's pretty much how I'd explain it. So you can group countries into regions, or you can find um, a set of countries to be the top 10 and bottom 10. I think a set says like Boolean filters. Yeah, so it's part of the set or you're not. So yeah, it's a filter, but you don't actually filter out the data, you just classify it as right. in or out, right. which is nice. So this is, this is, as I said, the most common kind of question you get in the exam is, can you find on the country or on the map, highlight these groups, and then, as I said, you're going to later use this group for something else. So in my case, I created a group and then made them uh, make another group on that group, but often it's usually the case that they say, make a group and then find sales of that group. Uh, relatively straightforward. If you know how to group, just you know hover um, and circle around your points and create group or create a set. They have slightly different uh, icons to indicate. And I just had them do a few exercises to really get familiar with the differences and, and that you can use them in calculations. Um, let me just skip through some of these other exercises. Um, just you know using sets in different ways, uh, how you can use them to add color and context to each of your maps. Just getting really familiar with them. They're, they're straightforward, just practice. Yeah. And then um, little nuances. They won't ever ask you this in the exam, at least I've not come across it, but just being able to use sets across data sources, that's kind of one of those things we don't really touch upon. Um, so you can use it as a um, secondary data source. You can, you can bring a set in um, and use it to uh, don't work groups don't. Um, I, I'm not actually not trying to see if you can do a calculation, but yeah, we just, yeah. So we just did this and um, we're able to group our data from one data set based on a set from another data set without having to recreate that set, which was nice. So I think that was, um, oh yeah, as I mentioned, the last two topics, which they will ask you, Benning and um, Will has already gone into, so I won't, I won't go into too much detail, but it would be very useful to get familiar with that because sometimes they ask LOD questions with binning as well, which can, once again, be a little bit tricky. And then clustering, I don't think I've seen the mass clustering, to be honest. Has anybody come across a clustering question? Yeah, I probably won't ask that on the QA exam. They might on the desktop certification. Yeah. So that's, that's from my end, both as a general overview of organizing your data, but also for the exam. Well All right. Cool. Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, so this week myself and Elena did a presentation on calculations. So as you can see, <laughs> quite quite a lengthy presentation. So I'm going to keep it down to three topics, um, and and these three topics are mostly linked to the questions that I can remember <laughs> from the exam that I took, because I think that would be the most use to anyone who's listening in. Um, so obviously, like calculations itself is a massive topic, and um, so we kind of started with the basics. And to be fair, um, you know, operators, if anyone's ever used Excel should be relatively familiar with these. Um, you've got kind of four main four, four main um, four main types of operator. Uh, through the basic kind of addition, subtraction, um, you've then got obviously like your arithmetic ones, so more multiplication division. You've also got this modulo function that essentially leaves you a remainder if you do if you divide something that has a remainder. And then you have the power which is you know two squared, three squared, etc. You've then got some of these comparison operators. So these are um, for use in calculations. Uh, these will give you a Boolean answer, so that's a true or a false. Uh, and then you've got these logical operators, which again give you a Boolean. Um, and these are kind of like and. So in that case, both sides of the 
argument has to be true, or, or where one side of the argument can be true, um, or you've got a knot which will negate any Boolean value that comes out. But yeah, so, so I'm talking about operators, but this is because, like, I, I mean, one of the questions that I can remember um, was, was made, made use of this. So if I flip over into Tableau here, um, I've just kind of prepared the work. So if, I remember like, it went along with kind of lines of like, oh, can you tell us how many, how many orders were made where sales went over like 10,000 and the discount was under 10%? And, you know, obviously like not exact figures, but something similar to that. So if I was to do that, um, so here I've dragged on my order ID onto the row shelf. Um, and obviously I've built this calculation um, using, as you can see, these operators. So this is this greater than operator. I've used the logical and here, um, and then I've used the less than here. So relatively simple, but I know this comes up in the exam. So it's something to, like, you know, something to be aware of. Um, if we so obviously I've added the filter here. See if I turn this. Uh, if I put the false back up, all the orders come back in. So the question will go, yeah, like how many orders kind of satisfy these criteria? So it's quite useful to know, um, and it's almost certain to come up. So yeah, cover off those basics such as general operators. Um, equally, like another one that I remember was along the lines of um, the question was like how. Uh, can you tell me how many customers had the first letter of their name as A? Um, which kind of sounds a really random question, but obviously Tableau are really trying to get you to uh, test out their products, and I think it's to work with string functions. So if I can find in here the slide to do with string. Uh, yeah, here we go. So these are kind of like your basic string functions. Um, for those of you who, who kind of use Tableau, if I start up a new tab, you can find these um, different categories of functions within here. So um, if you click your little carrot here and you can click, click, create calculated field, you'll come into this calculation window. If you click on this down arrow, you can see different types. So when I'm saying string calculations, that's what I'm referring to. So if I click in here, you can see there's a lot in here. Obviously, you don't, you don't tend to use uh, all of these. Especially, especially for the QA exam. But when you get a question similar to like um, how many customers have the first, you know, how many how many customers have the first letter of their name, or make orders like who have the first letter A, and um, this is how you do it. So you kind of go first letter, we'll call this that, um, and then if we use this left function, um, and what this does is it will cut off um, from the left hand side of, of something. So I drag in customer here and I tell it to take, so it's asking me how many characters do you want to take from the left of customer name. So if I just take one and I click that, then I'm going to, uh, so just to highlight how this how this will work. So here you'd expect all these to be A's if I drag um, this calculated field onto the rows shelf. And yeah, that's what you get. And then we want to do this, um, so what, you know, what Tableau is great at is taking the dimension as Will mentioned earlier um, and aggregating it, so you can actually do um, what we what we would call a count, and um, we can do a count distinctive because obviously they're individual customers. Um, so it's going to be one here, but if I take off um, if I take off customer name, you can then see that we get uh, that result. So it's quite a useful way. I mean, it's almost certain to come up. Like I remember it being in the exam. So good tip to know, get to get to know your, your string functions and your other types of functions, but that's like a relatively simple way of getting that answer um, you know, in a quick time to save yourself some time later on in the exam. Um, so also, last and not last and final, I, so, um, that's the so, so yeah, so another question that I vaguely remember was around kind of like what we call table calculations. Um, and also LEDs, which are kind of linked. And without going into too much depth, because I haven't got very much time, um, but these calculations are within Tableau. Um, they'll be performed on whatever you have in view, um, which is obviously quite difficult to understand in a short period of time. But it's, I mean, I, if I do an example, so like. So, what if we wanted to look at this as a distribution instead, right? So, we want to look at a percent of total. So, the question might be. Uh, how many, what, what's the 
what percentage of customers start with an A, B, or a C? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, like, it's not like the one question I remember was like how do orders change over years? Okay. Like how do numbers of orders oh, okay. change over okay. years? Yep. Um, so you know, if we take on uh, order date onto the, the column shelf, if we select years, um, and then obviously if we drag in here, if we do um, number of orders, um, so we'll do count distinct. And we could probably break this down a little bit further. So if we drag on yeah, segment to here. Um, so then using this using this here, if we drag this down, you can do what with what's termed as a quick table calculation. Um, so yeah, so you see here percent difference. So what Tableau will do is it, using it's like really clever stuff under the bonnet, it will work out percentage difference between each of these numbers. Um, and obviously, like um, when you're working within window, um, these calculations can occur at different levels. Um, so it's quite useful to kind of check um, how how this is doing it. So here you can see that it's at ca um, it's calculating it in terms of the previous value. So it's looking across here and saying what was this value and what's the percentage change from that? What's this value and the percentage change from that? So yeah, if you get a question like that, which I can absolutely remember, so saying what was the, what was the percentage like change since last year? This is how you do it using a table count. Obviously, you could also do it with a with a, um, a LOD, but obviously, and um, that would take a little bit more explanation. But but worth noting. So there's three questions that I had in my exam, um, and, and probably like quite useful to kind of get get down with if you're planning on taking the QA exam pretty soon. So yeah, hopefully that was quite useful. Yeah, we go to Elena next then. Hello there. Um, okay, so me and Alex were doing the part about calculations and uh, LODs. So as Alex said, um, the calculations are quite quite a big topic, and we couldn't cover all the possible uh, alter uh, ways that you can uh, write calculations. But it's worth noting that some of the calculations do um, do have greater percent of uh, appearing on the exam because they can be uh, quite useful. For example, uh, I like to point out the date calculations. Um, for example, let me just find, uh, yes, uh, date max, date min, uh, both can, uh, can be useful for the exam because you might need to find the first uh, date that an order was made or the first date that uh, certain customers uh, made their first order. Um, and as well, the date difference, where you may need to count how many days uh, are between the start um, the ship date and the order date, for example. So you would you would see what's the average on a, on a region, in a country, or per product. Uh, another interesting way of uh, showing things may be with filters. So you may have calculations that would would work well with filters, but at the same time, sometimes if you filter something out, you may find that the calculation doesn't show the exact number that, that's requested. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned the filters with calculations because my way of doing things is if I can do it quickly with a filter, I would do that first. So, for example, if we have this subcategory and sales, and if I filter down to a certain, I don't know, um, parts of the subcategory, and I need to find the percent of total, let's do a quick table calc, percent of total. So it will, um, it will calculate for all the categories, and if, if some of them have been excluded, it, you will get a different number over here, so that's worth uh, being careful about. And also, the edit table calculation is a good good thing to be very well aware of because um, the calculations that you're doing really depend on the dimensions that they, they're looking at when, when they're calculated. So for example, specific dimension, you can uh, choose subcategory or exclude subcategory. In this case, I don't have another dimension here to, to compute by, so I will leave it at some category. 
and if the the question was okay machines um, what's the percent of total for machines in let's say let's put in here in the last year we would be able to quickly find machines on here 5.97 so that's, that's another tip from me. Um, going down through the different types of calculations, uh, the, the case function, you can possibly substitute the if function with the case function, and the if is something that um, you would need to know in order to do well in the exam. It's quite versatile. So in our lecture, we went through a couple of examples for if. Um, and the different forms of it. Let me see. So yeah, uh, when it comes down to calculations, I would say that practice is most important because you really can't bet on something that it's going to work in this way and this way only. So doing as many uh, mock exams, uh, practice tests as you can. Um, the Tableau Qualified Associate, uh, Associate Exam Guide has a few examples. There are other sources online that you could use to just go through different types of calculations to practice. And for the LODs as well, um, it's worth noting that the LOD types will need to be known even, even if you only decide to uh, try to do it simply with, with just the fixed. You would still need to know the syntax and the computation of all of them. So I strongly suggest that practice as much as you can would be very, very useful. And yeah. All right. Um, who wants to go next? Yeah. Thank you, Elena. Hello everyone, uh, I'm AJ. So originally I was planning to do a presentation on machine learning because that's what I presented to the group um, after presenting it in front of Virgin. Uh, but then uh, since Lee's not here and then since you guys, I know you guys are tuned in on Friday afternoon for tips for your exams, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Lee's work. <laughs> <laughs> And then do a quick presentation on. Uh, he's not here, by the way. So yeah. He's work. yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure he's not gonna mind. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna talk about like uh, combining and restructuring data in Tableau. So all credit goes to Lee. Uh, so yeah, so the, some of the stuff that um, he talked about was unions, joins, cardinality, blends, and uh, data restructure. So uh, one of the caveats is like I think. Uh, a lot of us, surprisingly, we lost quite a lot of marks in the data structure part for some reason. Uh, I know I lost a few more, more marks than I thought I would, and it's meant to be one of the most basic part uh, of Tableau. So make sure you don't skip, just because it sounds very simple and very uh, theoretical, make sure you go over all of this stuff. So first, the unions. So when you do unions, you just basically um, stack two tables together, so it's essentially you're making more rows. Um, yeah, so but make sure they're both in the same format. That's very essential. Uh, so one of the examples that Lee used was uh, uh, different countries here and the population size, and obviously years had changed. So that would change into this. So all the colors, you can see how it has stacked, uh, all the tables have been stacked uh, together. So why would you use it? So you'd use it uh, if it's all in one format, uh, but you have multiple tables and you just want to produce one data set that you're going to work with. Uh, and as well as like, if you have multiple data, uh, data sources, but they have the same data and same data structure, you're going to bring it into Tableau together. It's a very good way to do it. Uh, and then I don't have a data set, so I'm not able to example. I, don't, I won't be able to show you an example of this. Uh, so we're going to move on to joints. The example there would be you've got, you have, in this particular example, it looks like yeah. there's there's three Excel files yeah. that uh, all have the same structure, but maybe every week you get emailed a new file for a different month or a different week or something like that. Exactly. You want to just kind of stack them all together. Yeah. You so just yeah. drag one in, drag the other one on top of it, that kind of thing. 
Yes. Or three yes. tabs, three tabs, or three sheets versus the same. Yeah. 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 So if you have the same data that's coming in, like up to date data, right. right? It's a very good way to do it actually. Joints, which is a very big part of Tableau, and uh, it's also quite interesting because like few of us got joins wrong, even though it's like almost towards the end of our data school. But it's just because how ta how Tableau handles joins is very different to how Alltrix handles it. So if you have a mental, or like you think joins in Alltrix sense, you might get it wrong in Tableau. So you make sure you understand how it works really well. Uh, so essentially, what you're doing is he's joining two tables or sheets of data together. Uh, but then we all know, uh, yeah, and then one of the main things is that you need to have one common field to join them together. So it could be customer ID, row ID, but as long as it's the same fields, we need them. Um, so here, like, here are some examples that he gave us to do. So why would you use joins instead of unions or blends? So if you have uh, data with us, uh, and you want to supplement your data with other, uh, other data that could have give you more insights, more analytical power, that's when you start doing joins. Uh, it will help you bring multiple sheets and tables together, uh, and then it can also filter to the uh, data that you're actually really interested in. So it helps you make your data wider. Yes, exactly, yeah, essentially, yes, you make it analyze. Your other columns, to, right? Yeah. Uh, so the first part is the inner join. So inner join is probably like the easiest one to understand is uh, as long as you have, you're just getting data that matches and nothing else. So you have two sets of tables, but you're only getting it where both fields are uh, found in both like one and two sheets. Uh, yeah, so for example, in this example, um, we know table one, ha table A has one, but we know that table B doesn't have one. So we'll just get no value for that. Uh, so in the inner join, right now, we only have two twos and only four four would match. So that's the only values we'd get. Yep, like I said, yeah, there's two, two, and four. Uh, left join. So left join, uh, in like I said earlier, like uh, the, or the way Autrix handles joins is very different to the way Tableau handles join. So when you do left join, you don't just get the left values, but you also get the inner values. Um, so if we look at an example for this, so for this example, we'll get all of the one, two, three, and four because it's left side of it, but we'll also get all the ones that matches, so two and four uh, from the table B section. So whereas in all tricks, you would just get one, two, three, and four, and that would be it. So it's very important for you to understand how that works. Um, a right joint, very similar, but, but the other way around. So you just get all the ones that are actually in the B side and the one in the center. Uh, and the last type of join would be the fuller outer join. That means you'd get everything. Doesn't matter if it matches or doesn't match, uh, doesn't match, you'll get all of the data set. So there you go. So this examples of two joins. Uh, also, yeah, so the one last thing that Tableau does really well is calculated joins. So, uh, so if um, if you can't match it to the direct field uh, within a Tableau, you can do uh, you can do formulas and you can have a calculated joins, which makes it very powerful to do. Uh, yeah. So some of the things that you want to consider when you're doing join is Firstly, make sure your type of join, what type of join it is, so left, right, inner, or outer. Uh, and then make sure you find some mismatches, like so you don't want to match on those. Uh, one of the key ones is to make sure none of your values have been duplicated. You don't want extra rows, which I'll come on to when I talk about cardinality. Uh, and then, yeah, you probably want to make sure you are not missing any, uh, any data because of the join you've used. Uh, loss of null values, is there more null values than you're expecting or less null values? Make sure you uh, you have all that information. Uh, and cardinality. Cardinality is very important to understand when you're talking about Tableau. Uh, so, it, yeah, cardinality is like how like uh, how rows in the data set relate to each other. So there are three main types of cardinality, one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many. So right now in this table, if you can see this table, like we can do, we know we can just join when we want to join them. 
uh, we can just join it on customer ID and customer ID, and this would be one to one because we're not gonna get any other matches. So we, right now we just get three rows. That's not gonna change at all. One row for uh, customer ID. There you go. Oh, sorry. And then the other one could be one to many. Uh, so what that means is, so if we look at the table on the left, I've got three customer IDs, uh, but on the right, I know uh, I have multiple. Uh, I have uh, three customer, uh, three different types. Of, oh, I've got two different customer IDs, but then they've all ordered multiple times. So what that means is that uh, I, I might have one. Well, yeah. So when I match it, I'll have one too many uh, cardinality. So I'll have multiple rows for that. So yeah, essentially that. Uh, and lastly, would be many to many. Um, yeah, the best example, and I think we all agreed in the group, like how this example really works, is basically in the left table, it's just name of different movies, uh, and the right, the genre, genres of different movies, and one movie can have multiple genres, just like one genre can have multiple movies. So you'll get multiple rows uh, when you have multi, many to many cardinality. Uh, and the last one and the best part is the blend. Uh, so blend is basically the uh, supplementary or primary data source with fields of secondary data source and it's usually uh, formed by relationship. Um, so, so, can, so basically, yeah, so why would you use blend? Uh, you can blend multiple data sources and uh, you can form different types of connections depending on the relationship. Uh, data is then on common dimensions, and then essentially, in a way, it acts a lot like uh, left join, as we talked earlier, uh, on the primary joins, and then you bring data from the secondary join. Uh, and then why would you, uh, why and when would you use uh, blends? So you'd use it when a join is not possible uh, because of the way the database is stored. Uh, uh, depends on, yeah, so if there's a diff uh, difference in granularity between different uh, data sets, you probably want to consider join, uh, you probably want to consider blend, sorry. <clears throat> and then if the data source is not formatted properly, again, blend is your answer. And then it's very, also, a blend is like most commonly used if you don't want any duplications caused by join. And lastly, if you have a large data set, you probably want to consider blend instead of uh, joins. <clears throat> Uh, so I think the last topic I'm going to talk about is the restructuring data sets. Uh, so yeah, so one of the things like Tableau, we all agree, like we all know Tableau likes rows rather than a lot of like big columns. So it's uh, tall and narrow rather than thin and long. So what you want to do is, uh, so if you don't want to use Autrix, you can just use uh, Tableau's pivot feature uh, and restructure the data so you get the way it actually likes to structure it. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments section and we'll reply. Hi guys, I'm Jamie. Similar to AJ, I had a task based on all six this week. So what I'm going to do is I'm quickly going to run through a couple of questions and they're going to be related to the analytics pane. So I'm going to quickly show you how to build up the questions relating to the analytics pane. The first one will be related to doing a six month moving average because there was a trick here, we managed to catch out one of our colleagues. The second one will be showing you how to quickly do a forecast and how to edit it just in case they try and trick you with that. And the final one will show you how to do a box plot and in relation to a question that they, get, they gave me regarding the box plot. So the first question I'm going to try and answer by building out for you is, for the central region, what was the six month moving average for cells in November 2015? So because it's asked for November 2015, I know that the date field that I'm going to have to pull into, I'm going to have to create a date field. And it's going to have to, have to be continuous over months as it's a moving average. So as you notice, just then I pull into columns, I pulled months and turned it into a moving average. It also, it also requested sales in the question. No, sorry, profit. So I've also pulled profit into my rows. 
And now, most importantly, it asks for the central region. So to do that, I must ensure that I pull regions into filters and make sure it's focused on the central. Now, the question that I said earlier, they wanted to know what the six-month moving profit was for in November 2015. And to do a moving, to do a to do a moving average calculation, you can do you can do a quick table you can do a table calculation. So here I'll put in the quick moving average. But at the moment I don't know what this moving average is for. Well I've clicked quick moving average. So if I go into edit table calculation, I can now actually see what the calculation is. So as you can see it's a moving calculation. And when I click into the average, it says it's only the previous two values. And really importantly here, current values tick. So one of one of the members of the room here didn't realise current members was ticked for this question. So he changed the previous values to six for six month moving average, which meant when he gave his answer it was incorrect. So here, even as a six month moving average question, you have five previous values plus the current value ticked. So really important to check all the, when you go into a table calculation, check all the settings, because they do try and catch you out on little things like this. And if you miss this, you can you can lose some key points, which can end up in you failing the exam. But now I've got this. I now go over November 2015. Which is here, and it says my moving profit at that time was 5,285. So, as I said, that's a really quick run. It's a, it's a really quick run through to answer. That is really quick to answer what sounded like quite a complicated question. But the trick was making sure you go into the settings of the table calculation you've used. So, with a lot of these things with analytics, is you can alter settings. Like Will earlier showed you the polynomial thing. With a lot of analytics and the more advanced things in Tableau, it, it have a default setting. And the test, the exam will try and test you to make sure you actually know that this has to, this can be changed. And for, according to the question you need to answer, you possibly have to change that. The second one is just going to be, it's just going to be a basic forecast. So, so one I had was say for for, for a segment, I had what, what was the what was the expected forecast for the next two quarters. So to do this once again, I need to pull in an order date. And as it's quarter, I need to change this to quarter. And because I'm predicting something in the future, I need it to be continuous. The dates, the dates will be continuous. So at the bottom here, I've chosen quarters here and cells. And now to do a forecast, I'd merely click on the analytics pane and drag it on here. So as you can see here, one, two, it's done the next five, five quarters. And as I said, in, in two, my, my question was in two quarters time, what, what was the expected forecast? So here is the expected forecast. But Tableau might, this is a relatively simple question, Tableau might trick you and ask for a, for, for a quarter, which is further out of this range and so forth. So to, check, to once again, to delve deeper and actually change the settings, which is the most checking the exam, if you go into analysis and go to forecast options, you know here you can see it's automated to the next five quarters. You can change it. You can change it to exactly the number of quarters you want. So at the moment it's on years, but it's two years. But as I said, within quarters, I can change it to just two quarters. So I know the final point is my quarter. The rest here is the rest here is just saying how the source data is aggregated. This is for the question answer. I didn't need to change this, and this prediction interval I don't need to change. But all this does this changes the bands around around the forecast, as you can see, and that shows that shows essentially where 95% of the time you expect the forecast in the future to fall in. So once again, quick and easy to answer what seems like quite a complex question, but just delve into, delve into the options is the biggest thing I can drill in because you never know. You never know what's in there and what they're trying to trick you with. I think the other thing which you were really um, keen to mention is that if you don't put the date in the continuous field, you're also... Yeah, you can't do... Yeah, if you don't put date into continuous field, you can't do forecasts or predictions on that, date. That checks a lot of people up. Like, a lot of people don't understand that because it will separate the dates by months and you won't understand that the dates are related. So ensure when you're doing a forecast or a moving average, make sure it's continuous because if it's not continuous, it may it may, it may want the previous two months and, it's only, and it may want the previous six months across two different years. So the final quarter of one year and the, fi and the first quarter of the year. And if, those and if you've separated your... your um, Time frame by years, it won't recognise the three of those months when you're doing the running total. So yeah, it's really important to make sure the date field is continuous when you're doing predictions with dates. 
And my final tip in regard to analytics is just a quick look of how, how they could ask you a question in relation to Fox Blog. So question, the question we had was which, which product category has the highest interquartile range for sales? So we know, it wants, we know it wants to ask about product categories and we'll get that into the field. And we know sales. And here is the bar. And as you can notice, when I click into analytics, I can't actually do a box plot and do an interquartile range. This is because the data is not aggregated and an interquartile range can only work if the data is aggregated to a, to a lower level than what's on screen. So here, because it's a product category, the hint's in the title that you're going to want to aggregate the data down to products. So to do that, if you bring, if you bring product into screen, into product name, into detail, this will aggregate the data. And to make it to make it look, e look easier now for box plot, I'll create circles for each category. And now, as you can see, I've now, now disaggregated the data on the screen. The box plot is now available because it's actually available, able to create ranges. And from here, I will now pull the box plot onto the screen. And here you can just see, here's, here's some options again. So you can see, here's the interquartile range question again. So this is going to be data within 1.5 interquartile. Here, you can't, really change, you can't change it outside of this. It can either be that or the maximum extent of the data. So we know for the purpose of this question, it would be within 1.5 of the interquartile range. And here, here it's not very clear because the sizing is quite low, so I'm going to make, make it inside view. You can see it's really tight between furniture and technology. So here to work out which one has the high, highest interquartile range, the lower hinge and the upper hinge is the interquartile range, the, the gap between them two. So here you can just about do it by eye, but it's always best to confirm it by Calculation, so it's around 2,400 here in the range. And here's 2,000, so technology would be your answer here. But as I said, once again, make sure you can make sure you get the data to a level where you can actually use, use a box plot. So as I said here in the question, it says, which product category has the lowest interquartile range? So if you just put product category on the screen and try to pull a box plot onto create an interquartile range, you wouldn't be able to do it. You need to understand that you need to aggregate the data to a lower level, which would be product here, this is product rank, this is product category. You need to bring that in to be able to build a box plot and be able to get into quartile range. So that's a quick demo of going over three questions and just the way they will try and trick you and you need to work around the question. Like the questions are not as straightforward as they may first seem. And also when you're creating the table, always look in the settings of whatever analytics you're using or moving average or table cap to ensure that it's correctly modified to answer your question. Well done. Yeah. All right. Is that the last one? Yes. Yeah, All right. So thank you very much for tuning in. Um, recording of this will be up on YouTube as soon as we can get it up. So if you know anybody that would benefit from this, just point them to the Information Lab YouTube channel, and you'll see it over there. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye.